Does death have the last word? Our text this morning is John chapter 11, verses 1 through 45. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing upon us this morning for preacher to preach accurately, for hearer to hear accurately. May we hear it, and may we do it, and may we be encouraged by it. For we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. John L. Sullivan was the big man of his age. The massive Sullivan was an unstoppable bare knuckles fighter who famously said, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Sullivan won over 450 fights, some lasting as long as 75 rounds. No one was big enough until James Corbett defeated him in his only professional loss. The big, unstoppable opponent of this age after the fall is death. No one can stop him or thwart his coming. But this morning in the Gospel of John, we'll see that death isn't big enough. Death isn't big enough. Go ahead and open up your Bibles to John chapter 11. We're going to begin in verse 1. John chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. And it says there in verse 1, now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. Now here we have a man, his name is Lazarus. He's in the inner circle of the apostles and disciples. So we've got the 12 apostles and then we've got this outer circle of people that are close. And this would include Mary, Martha, and their brother, Lazarus. They're close to Jesus and Lazarus is sick. Like so many who are afraid to become sick to death today in our land and across the world. Death is knocking so the man's sister sends for Jesus, the great physician. Going on to verse four. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Jesus says this situation will not ultimately lead to death, but it's for this purpose. It will lead to glory for God and the Son of God. Verse five. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after he had said this to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you and you are going there again? Now notice the text tells us, Jesus loves this family. Jesus loves Mary and Martha. Jesus loves Lazarus and yet he waited two days. He waited two days. Why did he wait two more days? Now look at the chronology of what's going on here. From where they're at, a messenger coming from Mary and Martha would have had to have traveled one day. Jesus waits two days, and then when Jesus departs, it's another day, so we've got a total of four days, and we'll find out in the text in just a minute that Jesus knew Lazarus was already dead. Now they head back down. They go to Bethany. Bethany's a short distance maybe an hour's walk from Jerusalem up the Mount of Olives, and his disciples say, we're going back to Jerusalem when they just tried to kill you? Jesus, are you out of your mind? Verse nine, Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Jesus is essence saying, Don't worry about those who are trying to take my life. Don't worry about my enemies and your enemies. We're walking in the light of day right now. Jesus has work to do, and Jesus is the light of the world. Going on to verse 11. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. So Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. 
Now, why sleep? If you look at the scriptures from one end to the other, you often see this motif. Speaking of people who have died as people who have fallen asleep. Why? Because death from the perspective of God is sleep. God can awaken the dead, and the disciples are completely clue, clueless on this matter. Going into verse 17. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Now it seems here that death has won. Kids, if you're looking at this text up to this point, it seems that death has won. Four days in the tomb in Israel, which has a Mediterranean climate, something like Southern California, means that inside that tomb is a swollen, rotting, death-filled corpse. And here we have the death crowd gathered together. The body's been prepared. Now, Israel in some ways, I suppose, has some analogs to central Texas here, because if you dig down, you only have a, a little bit of soil, and underneath it's all rock, like it is in the Holy Land. That's why we got the parable of the sower. And you got rocky outcroppings, and people would carve tombs into them. They made caves into the side of these cliffs, and then they would carve into that like a bench, like a little bed, into the stone. And then they would roll a stone over the front of the tomb. Now, death was very personal in the first century. They didn't have mortuaries. They didn't have refrigeration like we do. When somebody dies, you've got to prepare that body and move it into the tomb that very day. And so when Lazarus died, his friends and his family would have gathered together. They would have washed his body and prepared it for burial. They would have wrapped him in linen strips that was interspersed with paste spices so that he would look like a mummy. There would have probably been, because they were a people of means, hired mourners amongst the crowd, and they would have carried his body to the edge of town and placed him in a tomb. The body has already been washed and is interred, and the death crowd has gathered. Verse 20. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died but even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Martha believes that Jesus could have prevented death if only he had gotten here in time. Martha believes God can raise the dead, just not now, but at the final resurrection. Going on to verse 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. Now it seems that this question of resurrection has gone over her head a bit. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Jesus is the resurrection and the life, and whoever believes in Jesus shall never die. Do you believe, Martha? Do you believe? Do you believe it, brethren? Do you believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life? Going on to verse 28. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. Now Mary runs out to meet Jesus. She needs Jesus in a time of death. You need Jesus in a time of death. Verse 31, when the Jews were with her in the house consoling her, Mary saw Mary rise quickly and go out. They followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Mary believes Jesus could have prevented death. Martha believes Jesus could have prevented death if only he had gotten here in time. Verse 33, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. 
Jesus wept. Death troubles Jesus. You know, we oftentimes think of Jesus and there's all these first century, second, third, and fourth century heresies that wanted to protect God from the idea of taking on human flesh. Wanted to protect God and sometimes importing in ideas from Greek philosophy on the impassibility of God to the point where Jesus has no real passions. Where Jesus seems less than human. But Jesus is 100% man and 100% God. Death troubles Jesus. It's not natural. It's not right. We were not created to die. He loved and he wept. Jesus knows our fears, knows our sorrows over death. Jesus loves us. Going into verse 36. So, So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Now notice, we've got the same sort of mention here a third time. The crowd believes Jesus could have prevented death. Mary believes Jesus could have prevented death. Martha believes Jesus could have prevented death if only he had gotten here in time. Now look at the scene here, brethren. Here's a cave. It's a dead man inside of it. Been in there four days. A stone's rolled in front of it. Sound familiar? There would have been a divot carved into the stone entranceway. A large stone that might have had the shape of like a giant tablet or even a large round rock would have been rolled into place to keep out grave robbers to keep out critters. The stone's been rolled in front of this tomb. A dead man's been in it for four days. I imagine even with that stone there, the stench of death was everywhere. You see, place the person who had died onto that platform inside the tomb. Their body would break down. Insects would get in there. And after a year, there'd be nothing left but bones and the cloth strips and you'd come in and you'd sweep it all up and you'd gather the bones. It was called the ceremony of the gathering of bones and you had a little stone box It was called an ossuary and you placed the bones in it and then you stacked them up like a mausoleum. He's in there. He's been dead for four days. A stone's been rolled in the front of this tomb. Death has won or has it. Going into verse 39. Jesus said, take away the stone. Mary, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Jesus says, take away the stone. Martha says, why? Death has won, and Lazarus is returning to the dust. When the stone was rolled away, the stench of death must have been overpowering. A body lying out for four days in a Mediterranean climate would have been breaking down by that point in time. Jesus says, do you believe? You will see the glory of God. Verse 41, so they took away the stone and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you have sent me When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Jesus is all in. It's the son of man against death. Is there any bigger enemy than death? Is there any bigger enemy in this age than death? He defeated Alexander the Great. He defeated Julius Caesar. He defeated Genghis Khan. He defeated Napoleon Bonaparte. He defeated Adolf Hitler. Is there any bigger enemy in this age, a time like this that we've passed through over the last several years, brethren, has made us all face, to one degree or another, our greatest enemy. He who will not be thwarted, death. Jesus is all in. It's the son of man against death. Lazarus, come out. Willie, kids, Jesus told the dead man to come out. Is he going to come out? Verse 44, the man who had died came out, his hands and his feet bound with linen strips, his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary 
and had seen what, they, what he did, believed in him. Can you imagine the scene? The stone rolled away. The darkness of the tomb. Shafts of light piercing in there into the shadowiness. The stench of death rolling out. And Jesus says, Lazarus, come out! And everybody's thinking, Jesus is crazy. Nobody's ever done this before. We know that Lazarus is dead. We washed his body. We took it into the tomb. We can smell his decomposition, and yet they see something stirring in the darkness. There's some movement in there. And then a figure appears. A mummy comes walking out. Lazarus is alive. Get those linen strips off of him. And the dead man came out because death isn't big enough, brethren. Death isn't big enough. In the midst of pandemics and economic downturns, in the midst of rioting and violence, we as Christians should not be afraid of death. Our physical bodies are going to die in this age, but in Christ we will be resurrected on the last day to glory. We need to tell this generation that we can't hide from and ignore death, but we can find a cure to it. We will be raised from the dead because death isn't big enough to stop Jesus. Can I hear an amen to that? The rock of Gibraltar is a massive rock, 1,400 feet tall that guards the entrance into the Mediterranean Sea from the Atlantic Ocean. Who can move it? What man could move it? Standing at the end of human existence stands something else immovable that guards the limit of life. Death. Who can move it? What man could move it? The Son of Man can. The rock can. If Jesus defeated death, then what kind of people should we be? We should be absolutely, positively, confidently hopeful and fearless spreading the message of life and hope in a time of fear and division this is your moment brethren in tumultuous historic events your great grandchildren will speak of your deeds in these days pandemics and economic downturns aren't big enough violence and destruction aren't big enough this morning in the gospel of john we've seen death isn't big enough. Soli Deo Gloria, to God alone be the glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing upon us to rejoice in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, he who raises the dead, and we who are raised in him. Bless us to meditate upon this, to rejoice in it, and invite others to come into our hope. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.